Uh, it's not an easy thing. We're going to study a little bit tonight. Matthew chapter 1, if you want to stand, that's fine. We'll be there just for long enough to read the verse. Amen. Matthew chapter 1, I appreciate you standing in the honor of the reading of the Lord's Word. And uh, some of the stuff, a fellow said to me one time, he said, why are you... Why don't you teach them all this stuff about the Bible? I said, because they don't know. And he said, well, that'll create problems for you. And I said, well, I don't think you can teach the Bible and cause problems for you. There'll always be somebody that'll come along and say, you know, you shouldn't do this. But if, if I know something about this, I feel like you should know it. Amen. I'm not supposed to hide the light under a bushel, right? That's right. Amen. When you get saved, aren't you supposed to tell other people? Yes, sir. Well, isn't there more in the Bible than just salvation? Yep. Isn't there more in the Bible than just don't quit, stop? Yep. Not just touch not, taste not, handle not, and all that kind of stuff. Isn't there more in the Bible than, than those kind of things? Amen. Well, some of the things that are in there is it has to do with what they try to do to keep you from getting the truth. And I think you should know what they are. And if you choose to accept them, then fine. And if you don't, you think it's no big deal, then that's fine. But there's an attack on the Word of God if you've got a King James Bible. And it's a real subtle thing. And it's done not only for the benefit of money. It's not just human instrumentation. It's demonic. Right. As much as the Holy Spirit is behind the inspiration of the Bible you got, a demonic spirit is behind the under 300 and some odd translations that are out there. And it's done to veil a truth from you, to hide some things from you. So I'll give you a few of them here and give you some comments on them and let you see how they're connected with Catholicism and everything else along the way. All right, uh, Matthew chapter number 1, we'll start in verse number 25. Uh, 24, then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Father, we pray that you might help us now as we go through these things and we ask your blessings upon it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now here's one of the things you might like to mark in your Bible. When I say might like to you, some of you again may not be interested in this. But how come it is that in the other new versions, they take out the word firstborn? You know why they take out the word firstborn? Because if they don't take out firstborn, it indicates Mary had more than one child. That means she wasn't a perpetual virgin. That would mean, if you'll think about it for just a little while, that would mean that somebody who has a Roman Catholic background is in the process of trying to conceal something from you. Why would you take that out of there? Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter number 13. You say, well, what difference does it make? Well, two things. Number one, Mary's not a perpetual virgin. She's not pure and she's not holy. And she had to bring a sacrifice with her when she came. Yes, Second of all, uh, the Bible clearly says here that knew or not, that's the virgin birth, but it doesn't mean she was never known after that. Her and Joseph had children. Sure Matthew chapter number 13, look if you will please in verse number 55. 13, 55. The Bible says this about Jesus. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Now let me ask you a question. Doesn't it just tell you that Jesus has brothers and sisters? Amen. Well, why would somebody take firstborn out of there? Look, if you will, please, in your Bible, come to John chapter number 2. John chapter 2. Now, why do I show you this? I show you this to show you that there's somebody that is behind another manuscript that's taken things out of the Bible with, a, with a, a, an intent. It's not a, oops, excuse me, a mistake. It's an intent. Can you move that for me, please, Brother Brad? John chapter 2. When TK and the other guys are here, they usually grab it right off. John chapter 2, look in verse number 12. The Bible says this, after this he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples and they continued there not many days. Now this is one of the verses that they'll question you a little bit on and what they'll say is, come to the book of Luke, they'll say, well the word mother or brother and sister there actually is, should be cousins. Okay, well let's just say it was cousins for a minute. Let's look and see if the Holy Spirit uses the word cousins and I'll show you how messing with one word can change the meaning of something entirely. If you want to go get the trilateral meaning or root word, then you try to say, well, what brother could mean is it could mean cousin, or what the word could mean in the Old Testament when he says replenish, that word could mean fill, and then you can change the Bible and all the cross-references that go with it by changing one word. 
Now, what that does is it makes you successful in changing that one word, ladies and gentlemen, at showing that Mary was a perpetual virgin and that she was pure and sinless, which the, the plot will thicken in just a minute because after a little bit, these new Bibles will make Jesus a sinner. Amen. Amen. They'll show that Jesus Christ was no better than me and you. If that's the, the truth, if Jesus Christ was not God's only begotten Son, we in some serious trouble. All right, let's just look at this word cousin here for a second. Look in Luke chapter number 1, look at verse number 36. If it is cousins and not really brethren and sisters, verse number 36. Here is uh, talking about Elizabeth and talking about John the Baptist. The Bible says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was, who was uh, called barren. Look, if you will, please, in the same chapter. Look in verse number 58. Verse number 58. Oh, verse number 58, the Bible says, And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Let me ask you a question. If the Holy Spirit used the cousins in one place, and it was Jesus' cousin, not his brethren and sisters, why didn't he use the word cousin again if he didn't mean brethren and sisters? Answer, because he meant brethren and sisters. Let me show you this thing here, if I can. Look in John chapter number 2 again. John chapter number 2. Well, this one will probably uh, shock you a little bit. I think it will. John chapter number 2. Same place where you just were right there, talking about his mother and his uh, brethren and disciples and that kind of thing. And come down, if you will, please. He drives them out of the temple in verse number 15. And verse number 16, he says, And he said to them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not thy, my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I wonder what that's a reference to. Psalms chapter 69. You've got to get all of it together. It's a prophecy. Psalms chapter 69. People say Jesus Christ never knew what it is like to, to go through and be uh, rejected by his own. Why, Jesus Christ even had a brother by the name of James that wasn't saved until after the resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians 15. James rejected him the entire time until after the crucifixion. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 69. Look, if you will, verse number, let's see, oh, 8. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. I'm a stranger to who? My mother's children. He's talking about my own brothers and sisters. Now do you understand the passage in uh, Luke chapter number 14 where he says, Whoso loveth mother or father or sister or brother or husband and wife or children... Cannot be my disciple? See, so what a terrible thing to say. No, he's saying, I'm first. Now, you must be, you must be God manifest in the flesh if you're going to be first and, make, and, and demand somebody to love you more than they love their own family. That's something you ought to pay attention to. Look in Mark chapter number 6. Mark chapter number 6. I like to hear them pages turn. Mark chapter number 6, look in verse number 3. All this out of one verse. They took firstborn out. They're trying to cover something up. They want you worshiping Mary instead of worshiping Jesus. Mark chapter 6, by the way, Mary can't save you. You can pray to her all day long. If Mary was uh, uh, not a sinner, you know what that Bible says? That woman is unclean, and he that cometh forth out of the woman is unclean. Well, that means what? That means she's a sinner. <laughs> Did anybody here not come from a woman? <laughs> You're born dead in trespasses and sin. Right. The, Mark chapter number 6. It is, uh, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are, not the, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. They're offended nowadays about that. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, he says, among his own kin and his own house. His own kin and his own house rejected him. One more, Galatians chapter number 1, and we'll move on to the next verse. Galatians chapter number 1. 
Now, I think these things are important, and, and I have to say this. You can't go out and chop some uh, 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 Catholic's head off with it, but if they had a Bible, isn't it interesting they don't? How many of you were Catholic before you got saved? Can I see your hands? All right, can I ask you a question? And I'd like a show of hands, if you could, please. How many of you carried a Bible to Mass? Can I see your hands? You didn't carry a Bible? Okay, you carried a prayer missile, right? How many of you carried it with you when you went? One, two, three on occasion, out of all those that were there. How many of you heard the sermons in Latin? Okay. Any, how many of you understand Latin? <laughs> do you not find that odd? I do. I think it's strange. If they had a Bible and they don't, you say, why? That's the Catholic Church way of keeping people in the Catholic Church. They don't give them the information that I'm giving you right now and let them decide on their own. When you present the gospel of salvation to somebody, all you're doing is giving them an opportunity. That's all you're doing. You're not trying to be mean-spirited and trying to drive something down their throat. Your job is to present the gospel and leave the rest of it up to the Holy Spirit. You don't save anybody. You point them in the direction. You give them the opportunity. And if they choose to take it, fine. And if they don't take it, that's not, it's not your deal. It has to do with that. Galatians chapter number 1. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 19. Here's a definitive verse. He's talking about James, uh, verse number 19, James the Lord's brother. But the other apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. What? But Jesus didn't have any brothers. Well, what he, what he doesn't really mean brother there. Okay, bring out your argument, bring out your Greek Testament, and bring your lexicon and try to figure it out unless you just want to believe it like it's written and you want to understand that if they take that one cross-reference out, how many, I don't know, I didn't count them, how many cross-references I give you? Half a dozen? You take firstborn out of that right there, you just lost all your cross-references. And that's not cross-references, by the way, from a Schofield Bible. That's running stuff on the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ and all that other stuff. All right, that's Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 25. We look at Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. This would be a good one for you because this gets into rightly dividing a little bit. Matthew chapter number 5. And this is another verse they mess up with. It's written over here on the end of the chart there. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha or Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. All right, now there's several things in that passage that they mess with. First thing they do is, is they take out the word without a cause. If you take out that word without a cause, you're going to have a serious problem because if you take out without a cause, you've got Jesus Christ being angry with them and running them out of the temple right there. And the Bible said he was angry, but he had a cause to be angry. But what they do when they take it out, they make Jesus Christ a sinner. Look in Mark chapter 3. Leave your finger there. We'll come back to it. Mark chapter number 3. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 5. Oh, let's get the, um, the context here. Uh, Jesus is there in verse number 3. And he said unto the man which had a withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or do evil, to save the life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them, with what? Anger. Jesus is angry. Well, if you take out without a cause then you've got him angry, and that means if that's the case, he's in danger of the judgment. Oh, well, preacher, they just took out the these and the thous. That has no thee or thou in it. They just took out without a cause. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit put that in there in Mark chapter 3? Now think about it, that when he wrote that Bible, if you take that out, you miss the cross-reference, and you think, well, Jesus shouldn't be getting angry. Any of you ever told that you're in danger of judgment if you lose your temper? Well, it's not biblical. It's without a cause. Some things you ought to get angry about. 
Be ye angry, he says, and sin not. The Bible says this, and being angry, look uh, down a little bit further there. He said, being grieved for the hardness of heart, he saith unto them, the man stretch out thy hand, and he stretched it out, and the hand was restored, and the whole as the other. Another place, he's getting ready to drive them out of the temple there, and he's angry. And he makes up a whip, and then he runs them out of the temple. You say, well, preacher, I don't really get the big deal. To me, it's a very big deal, because God has a reason to be angry. He says he's angry with the wicked every day. Well, if you go by this passage right here, then you either got a contradictory verse, number one, or number two, you got Jesus being a sinner. Let's go on just a little bit further in the same uh, passage right there. Uh, notice what he says, without a cause and danger of the judgment, whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, could I ask you a question? Any of you ever thought about or considered calling somebody Raka? Well, you've never even thought of that. You know what that is? That's Hebrew. That's Jewish. That's not for you. That's Hebrew. That's, that's the Jewish word. And shall be in danger of what? The council. Well, I've got to stop on that for just a minute. Uh, let's look at the danger of the council right here for a minute. Everywhere in the Bible, council shows up. It's not a good thing. <laughs> look in Matthew chapter 10. It's like a board. Matthew chapter 10. Now, I'll get to that other thing about fools in just a minute. But this has to do with the millennial kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. It has nothing whatsoever to do with you. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, he's dead. Now you can't get angry. And then now you can't say to somebody, Raka, and you can't some, call somebody fool. Well, Jesus called somebody a fool, and so did the apostles. The apostle Paul called them fools. Jesus on the road to Domaeus, he says to them, Oh, fools and slow a heart. Well, right here he says that he's in danger of hellfire. If you don't rightly divide it, you think Jesus was in danger of hellfire? How about the apostle Paul? I don't think he was, but if you don't rightly divide the Bible and you don't put that thing in the millennial kingdom where it belongs, you're headed for some serious trouble. Let's look at this thing about councils for just a second here. Matthew chapter number 10, oh, verse number 17. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. There's a, one of the first mentions of council. Come Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Men get together to plot against the Word of God. They get together to plot against men that are serving the Word of God. Matthew 26, and it's always a group of men that come together or a group of women and put together a council, Council of Trent. Amen. Councils, let's get together for a council. Here's a good one for you, City Council. Matthew chapter number 26, look if you will in verse number 59. 26, 59, and the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Let's get together and work our magic. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, completely blind and completely stupid to how things work. I know that they want to get a bill passed. They want to get something together. They call all the boys and call all the good old buddies, and they work their magic and get their deals, and I'll do this deal up there in Washington. If you'll do this deal for me, and we'll slip this into that bill, we'll slip that in. That's a group of individuals coming together and deciding what's best for people. That's not biblical. Find for me where it was ever run by a group of people. It's not. Whether you like the biblical way or not, it's not ever done that way. God chooses a man and he does that. Uh, he says, Moses, come here. Abraham, come here. Joshua, come here. Which one of them did the people vote in? Paul, come here. Peter, come here. Matthew, James, John, come here. Where did they, they vote them in? Well, the people. We the people. The people. The people. The people. Can you find for me a place in the Old Testament where the people chose their king? The only place you got is they said, Saul, we want a king like the other nations. You know what the Lord said? Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Sam, go down there and get him, Saul, and let him have it. They asked for it. They got it. That guy winds up taxing them until they lose everything they got and winds up leading them into wickedness until David comes along and then you know the rest of the story from there. But those things are appointed by God all through there. See, we like this idea of a democratic approach. What do you think is going to happen when the Lord is going to come here? When the Lord comes here, it's a monarchy. He's the king. No council come in there. And you get in trouble if you start having a council. Look, if you will, please, in, Ma in Acts chapter number 4. Well, preacher, you know, I just think, I know, I know. Get you a council together and come against Walmart. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, you're fickled. 
You can't have a council in your household, your house will fall apart. You and your wife may counsel together, but when you come out of there, you better come to a common decision or your kids will have a rebellion on the doorstep. And then you'll use mama against daddy and all that other stuff. I got caught doing that a couple of times. It took two times for me to learn that don't work. I thought I, I could trust my mom. You know, I would tell her something. She wouldn't tell dad. Boy, was I wrong about that. <laughs> and I would ask her something, and then she would say no. And then I would go to my dad and, hey, dad, you know, you think I could do so-and-so? And his first thing would be, well, have you talked to your mother? And he already knew I had. Well, I made the mistake one time. No, she said, don't matter to her, whatever you want to do. What'd you say? I said, no, she said it didn't matter. Well, you, it's either no or she said it didn't matter. Did you talk to her? <laughs> the next time I got caught, I got my hind end tore up on that one. And then the next time I got caught, I said, she said it didn't matter. He said, really? Well, I just got off the phone with her. And she said she told you no. Oh, man. <laughs> got Benedict Arnold in the house, you know. That's, you come together as a mom and dad, you find out your kids are working you. That plays to your ego, see. Well, I understand things about them that nobody else understands. And, you know, they just, they understand me better. And so I, yeah, you better watch that stuff. You're going to be stuck with that old guy or that old woman by the time them kids are out. You better know where your bread's buttered, boys. Right. Well, I'm telling you, you two should have a unified front. You may disagree in private, but in public, them two think, well, I'm talking to one and the same. Every time I, if I talk to her, it's going to be the same as I talk to him. My mom's answer for everything was, ask your dad. <laughs> See, why? Stay out of trouble that way. And then she knew if I was asking her, I probably had either already asked him or I didn't want to ask him because I knew what his answer was going to be. No. Because <laughs> you ask dumb things when you're a kid. Acts chapter number 4. Uh, Acts chapter number 4, look if you will please, in verse number, oh, what is it, 15 there, I believe? Yeah, that's it, 15. Acts four fifteen. Notice what he says. But when they had commanded them to go outside out of the, out of the council... They conferred among themselves. That's the time where uh, Peter gets the tar beat out of him. Matthew chapter number 5. Just a couple more here. Matthew chapter number 5. A lot in one verse, isn't there? Verse number 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for shame in his, for in his name. Councils mentioned, I think, ten times in the New Testament, and all of them are negative in connotation. You say, why? It's always an attempt to overthrow the Word of God or the person that's representing God. So you want to always be careful about that. All right, now let's look at this thing called fool. Little Matthew, if you will, please. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. I'm watching my time. I know much studies weariness to the flesh. But I had a, there was a thing going around. It was, uh, it was a thing called... Uh, it's coming to me. It's coming to me. BSF, Bible Study Fellowship. And what they were doing was going around, it was women teaching a bunch of women. And what they did was they handed all this stuff, literature, it was based on the NIV. And they were using this passage right here to try to teach you ladies how you should be, act and how you should behave when you're around other ladies. And that you're not ever supposed to get angry because you're in danger of the judgment. And how you're never supposed to say raka, and that world means foolish or foolish jesting. Or you're not supposed to say fool in the Bible, or you're in danger of the judgment questioning your salvation. Because in the new Bibles, all that stuff's changed. The without a cause is taken out. So there was a lot of women running around nervous as a cat because they had done everything but call a woman a fool and stupid and all kind of other things. And then sitting there saying, you know, they had a disagreement with other women and that they'd gotten mad about it. Now they're all under false conviction because they got mad over something. And some of the things they got mad about, they should have been mad about. But they were all under false conviction about it and they were all doing it because of studying. That stuff always degenerates to a Bible study. Somebody's going to teach you something that you can't get anywhere else. Somebody's going to teach you something you're not getting at church. Somebody's going to teach you something, answer some questions for you you can't get. It starts off well-meaning, but before long it deteriorates. And before long, that thing will, every time it'll turn around, especially if women are involved in it, it'll turn to some emotional pig slop and the women will be running around and throwing oil on people and the ostrilo shantai untai a bow tie economy honey, because you're emotionally driven. Happens every time. Well, here's just a little deeper understanding of the Word of God. Here's just something a little bit deeper for you. And the next thing you know, you've got a church split on your hands. You're going to do it. It's fine. It's your business. No problems. It's the Lord's church anyway. But you get that stuff going the wrong way and get in the false doctrine, you get all bound up in something. 
and you're twisted up, and these women are running around here on this verse right here that nobody told them is the constitution for the kingdom. It happens in the millennial kingdom. It has nothing to do with you. You can call somebody a fool all day long. And I did that one time when I was preaching. I said, well, that's the most foolish thing I ever heard. Now, you're a fool if you believe that. And he came up, the Bible says if you call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. You're not even saved. <laughs> I said, brother, you want to get the context of the passage there? I said, that's Matthew chapter 5. And I said, that has to do with the constitution of the kingdom, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's the constitution for the king. How are you going to do that? And I said, Jesus Christ called them fools. And he said, I beg your pardon. I showed him what I'm fixing to show you. And I said, the Apostle Paul called them fools. And he said, I beg your I said, he did now. Are you going to tell me they're in danger of the judgment? Well, I just know it says that if you say somebody's a fool, that you're in danger of hellfire. Well, you ain't going to make me doubt my salvation at all because of something I say. I'm saved because of what he did for me. <laughs> Nothing to do with whether that stuff comes out of my mouth or not. I've said a whole lot worse things than fool before. If it's based on the foolishness that comes out of your, my, uh, your mouth. Uh, look, if you will, here, where am I, where am I at here? Um, Matthew, where are we at? 23, that's it, 23. Look in verse number 17. Here's the Lord. Now, if you're going to take Matthew 5 literally, right? He just said, if you call somebody fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Is that what he said? Yes, sir. And what's hellfire? Hellfire is hellfire. We know that, right? All right, here's Jesus talking. Where's Miss Pat? You got red here? All right, written in red, if you've got the words of Christ in red. He gives them the woes there. Woe, 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 15, 14, 15, 16, 13, woe. Verse number uh, 17, ye fools and blind, whether is greater the gold of the temple is sanctified, whatsoever shall swear by the altar is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he be guilty, ye fools and blind. And then he goes on down through there and talks about that. He's walking on the road to Emmaus over there. You know what he calls them? He said, O fools and slow of heart. Now, if that fits for you, ladies and gentlemen, why is Jesus Christ using that? Isn't it interesting to you, the intricacies of the King James Bible, that in one verse over here he says, if you tell anybody they're a fool, you're in danger of hellfire, and then Jesus himself is over here saying, ye fools. If that is not a good case for rightly dividing your Bible, I don't know what it is. But you know what they do? That's a good case to say there's contradictions in the Bible, and they need man's intellect and man's education to straighten them out. No, you just need to rightly divide the word of truth. And then you don't have a contradiction or a problem. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. This is the one I just told you about just to give you the reference to it. You've got to study your Bible. Matthew 26, verse number... Uh, this is the one with the council here. Verse number... That's the wrong one. Um, Luke 12. I'm sorry, I already gave you that one. Luke 12. Excuse me. Scribal error. Luke 12. Now, I'm, I'm different. I think this stuff should be taught in every school. I think when your kid goes to public school, the first thing you ought to give him is a Bible with his book on arithmetic. And I think they ought to take one hour a day, and the kid gets to about third or fourth grade, and they ought to teach him this stuff. For just an hour, along with all the other stuff that he's going to need to succeed in life so that he can understand all the tricks of the trade and understand what man will do to make money. He'll even take the words of God and twist them around for his benefit. And think nothing of it. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse number 20. But God said unto them, Thou fool, this night to thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall... Now let me ask you a question. You think God himself is in danger of hellfire? God said, Thou fool. And these women are running around saying, Well, I called somebody a fool. Am I in danger of hellfire? Are you saved? Well, no. Yeah, you're in danger of hellfire. But not because you called somebody a fool. Because you are a fool. Because you hadn't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. This is one of my favorite passages. Sad hearts, glad hearts. Burning hearts. This is the boys on the road to Emmaus there. Luke 24, look if you will in verse number 25. Then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things than to enter into his glory, and to enter into his glory. The Lord himself is doing it. So you've got Jesus doing it, you've got God doing it. Now let's look at the apostle to the Gentiles, and we'll sew this part of it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll give you one more after this if we have time. I'm not even off the top line yet. 
you, it, it's interesting. And a lot of these things right here, these are, there's 46 of them that are listed, or 47 or so that are listed right here, but these are things that are not even listed, and a lot of people that have the stuff that's missing out of the Bible, some of them are, but some of them are not in there because they didn't figure they were worth mentioning. Well, I don't know, but the two verses I just gave you, one of them has to do with the deity of Christ, and the other has to do with whether or not somebody goes to heaven or hell by the way they speak, and making Jesus Christ a sinner. That affects your salvation. I think it's important for you to know that. I think it's important because you know what it does? It shows you the intricacies of the Bible. That if he wanted to use the word brethren, he could have used uh, cousin, but he chose to use the word brethren because he meant brethren. And that if he wanted to use the word fill, he could have used the word fill because he does it in the same passage where replenish shows up, but he doesn't do it. The Holy Spirit's got that thing laid out. And then in the other passage, you've got a guy calling to say, don't say fool, you're going to go to hell, so don't talk nasty to people and be kind to people. And a Christian's not supposed to talk bad about other people and stuff like that. And then the Lord's calling them fools, and God's calling them fools. And Paul, I'm going to show you, is calling them fools. That's somebody trying to control you. Now, I don't suggest you call somebody a fool unless you can back it up, but 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Is this boring you all to death? 1536. This is the Apostle Paul. This is a good verse in 33. Be not deceived, evil communication, corrupt good manner, wake to righteousness, and sin not, and some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And then he goes on down there. That's the Apostle Paul. Now, what's the significance of this? The Lord intentionally had them put the word fool in there. By God, by Jesus Christ, and by the Apostle Paul, and then he put the word fool over in Matthew 5. In police work, we used to call that a clue. He did that on, for a reason. He could have left fool out those other times. He put it in there for a reason, to show you you better rightly divide your Bible. He gives you one verse and says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, but then he gives you little clues, little breadcrumbs along the way. Well, if that word, if that passage fits you, then you've got Jesus in danger of going to hell, you've got God in danger of going to hell, and you've got Paul in danger of going to hell. And that's a bad, bad situation there. All right, come on down here, if you will, please, and let me, uh, let me skip down here. Let's see. This thing in Luke chapter 9, I think you've already gotten. I've already been over that with you. I'm going to get to these two on Sunday. I want to get this thing in Luke and show you one more thing. Luke chapter 9, or Mark chapter 9, 44, 46, and 48, those are your passages on, on uh, hell. Those are taken out of Jehovah's Witness Bible, a revised standard version. The better versions omit these verses, all that other kind of stuff. The Lord knew what he was doing when he put them in there. And those words, if Miss Pat were to take her Bible up here, show you those are the words of Jesus Christ you just took out of there. He spoke those words. That's the words of Christ talking about hell. Jesus preached on hell in spite of what a lot of people believe. He didn't get up and preach all this be a better you stuff. Luke chapter number 4. He said, get to know me and I'll straighten your noggin out. I showed you this one the other day and just make a real quick comment on it. Luke chapter number 4. Now I want you to, I want you to see what's going on and maybe you'll pick up on this. Maybe you won't, but let me show you what jumps off the page. Luke 4, 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. Now watch it. But by every word of God, right? That's right. If you're going to take words out of the Bible, don't you think you'd want that out of there? All your other versions take but by every word of God out. Why? Because they're taking words out of the Bible. So they mess with one of the verses that has to do with your King James Bible and says every word and that every word is pure. Every word of God is pure, right? Amen. They take the verse out. Why? Well, if you're going to take verses out, you better take the words out. You better take verses out that are going to condemn you for taking them out. Don't you see that's a little self-serving? It's kind of like fixing the test before you take it. Uh, look at Luke chapter number 2. This is a good one for you. Luke chapter 2. Uh, Brother Brad, get me uh, Isaiah chapter number 9, if you will, please, and get ready to read that, if you would. And Brother uh, Justin, uh, get me, if you will, Micah 5.5, 5, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Micah 5.5. 5. The rest of you come to Luke chapter 2. Let me show you something here. Luke chapter number 2, look, if you will, in verse number 14. 
2.14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's changed in all the other Bibles to uh, God will grant peace to those of goodwill. That's not what it says. What he's getting across here is, is what he's saying to you is, peace, goodwill toward men is a reference to Jesus Christ being the peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God where? In the highest. That's what's going on up there. And then God is sending peace, goodwill to men through Jesus Christ. Not I'm going to give goodwill to men, I'm going to give peace to men of goodwill. But they get all twisted up with that thing. Leave your finger right there for just a second. Look at Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. That's one of the greatest verses on the first coming and second coming of Christ and the deity of Christ. It's a gift being given. It has nothing to do with you and me at all. I came down here to bring peace. Really? Well, let's just see what the Bible says. Luke chapter number 12, verse number 51. This flies in the face of modern theology, what I'm about to show you. Jesus came down here, peace, 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 peace. There is no peace without the King of Peace. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you've got no peace. All right, look if you will please in Matthew, or Luke chapter 12, I'm sorry, look in verse number 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. What? He just said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And then the Lord himself says, nay, but I come to division. From henceforth there shall be five, lo five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law. Sound like I live in the south. In the, against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and so on and so forth. You know what the Lord just said? He said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And the Lord said, I didn't come to bring peace. You don't get peace unless you get in the king of peace. Look, if you will, please back up to Matthew again. Matthew chapter number 10. I know how we usually read the verse and what we think it means, but so the misconception is, is that, well, I'm a Christian now. I'm supposed to have peace all the time. <laughs> How's that working out for you? Well, he must have lied to me. No, you missed it. The peace that he's bringing and the goodwill is in Jesus Christ. It's referring to Him. It's like Jesus is peace and goodwill is peace. Brother Brad, you got that passage there in Isaiah 9? Could you read it real loud, please? 6 and uh, 7. Nine? Yeah. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The what? The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Who is the Prince of Peace a reference to? Jesus Christ, right? Well, there's your peace right there in Luke chapter 2. That's who it's referring to. You got the passage in Micah 5, 5? Can you read it real loud for me, please? And this man shall be the peace. And excuse me, this what? This man. This man. The peace he's referring to there is the man. The man is the peace. Not... Peace, bro. You know, not, you know, or victory or whatever that is. Not like that. The man is the peace. The man is being given as the peace. That's what he's talking about there. Are you in Matthew? Look, if you will, please, Matthew chapter 10. I had it. I threw it away here. Matthew chapter 10. God sent his son down as an act of goodwill toward men. That's how he did it, Right? Uh, God didn't just give goodwill to, I mean, give peace to men of goodwill. He gave peace to bad ones and good ones. It's everybody. I think that's what salvation is. Matthew chapter number 10, look if you will please in verse number 34. 1034. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and daughter and mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Man's foes will be those of his own household and so on and so forth. So when you come to Luke chapter number 2, flip back there real quick. What he's talking about there in Luke chapter number 2 is they take that or change that verse out altogether and say if you want to have glory to God... You're not going to have uh, peace unless you give glory to God. And the way you give glory to God is you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, let's see if i got a passage here in Romans, I think. I know it takes a little while to study it out, but you say, well, preacher, I don't really, you know, you read your Bible, you don't even know they've changed it. Romans chapter number 5, yeah, that's it. 
verse 1. I'll read this to you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the stuff Brother Greg was talking about in uh, Bible study, about what you get when you get in Christ. And that's one of the things you get. You get peace when there's storms going on all around you. So when they take that verse right there, what they do is, is they make that a works for salvation verse in verse number 14. What they do with that verse right there is, is they uh, change it enough so that what they can do is, is make you know that if you're a good person, God will give you peace. And if you're not, God won't. Will anybody in here get saved because you were a good person? Okay, I was just seeing if there's somebody. Because if you think you're a good person, you didn't get saved. Amen. You were a sinner when you came to the Lord. Right. All right, one more. Luke 2, 33, which you'll know what this one is. You've already seen this one, I'm sure. Luke 2, 33. I'll give you this one and one more. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. That doesn't seem like a big deal, right? They change that and take the word Joseph out and they make it father and mother. Well, that means you make Joseph the father of Jesus. That means you make him a human being. That means he's a sinner like you and I are because his blood's no good. And then you're in headed for some trouble. All right, last one, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Now, this one takes a, takes a little bit of, this is a, one of the sleight of hands thing. And here's what they'll do to you. Are you there? Luke 23, look in verse number 42. Watch. And he said unto Jesus, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What did I forget? That word set off by two commas. It's put there intentionally. You think Lord is important? Let me tell you why Lord is important here. This has to do with a thing called uh, where, monarchanism where they believe or they try to teach that when Jesus Christ got baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him and then he became Christ at his baptism. And then he comes all the way through and then he's hanging up there on the cross as a man and he's dying up there on the cross and he says, Father, uh, uh, forgive them, they know not what to do. And he looks up there and the Bible says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment, the Holy Spirit left him and he's no longer Christ. So now you've got his death coming after he's no longer Christ, and you would never know that because when he calls him Lord right there, he's showing that even though he was suffering for the sins of mankind, he was still God's only begotten son when he was suffering. You say, but preacher, it's just one little word. Yeah, it's just one little word, a little four-letter word called Lord, and it's taken out of all the other things because they're trying to tell you that Jesus wasn't anointed by the Holy Spirit and he wasn't God's Son until the Holy Spirit came on him at John's baptism, and then you go all the way out to Calvary, the second that God turned his back on him, that, that all of a sudden he's no longer deity and he dies as a human being. That one verse right there shows that he was still God manifest in the flesh. He refers to his father as Lord. You have two natures there. Now, really, would you even think about that? Would you even consider that? But all the verses I've given you already, probably you know, a couple of dozen maybe that I've given you, but that verse right there, wouldn't you think for just a minute if you were to look at that right there, there must be somebody wanting to veil some sort of truth from you? How could you say that's anything but demonically inspired? There's an attack on the book you got. And it's just a little word here and a little word there. And the common argument is, well, it's just the these and the thous. We get letters sometimes that come through Brother Sam, and they shoot them to me every now and then about, I hear what you're saying about the King James Bible, but I, just, I have to read other versions because I can't understand it. Well, you better get saved, first of all. And second of all, it comes from a willing heart and, a, and, a, and an interest in believing what he says, whether you understand it or not. But the bigger danger is, is that if I found out they took out just that one verse right there, it would make me skeptical about the piece of literature I was handling because all of a sudden they're going to determine when God becomes God enough to die for me. You just brought my, my salvation into question. You just brought eternal security into question. You just brought the redemption of mankind into question. You just brought every doctrine in the Bible because of that one thing. Because if that wasn't God that died on the cross like the Bible says, then we are all in a mess. We just, well, quit and run to the bar and do whatever you want to do because we're going to die and all of us are going to burn in hell. 
Because if he was not God manifest in the flesh, then that was just a man that died and he was a nice fellow and a good guy and all that kind of stuff. But your sins hadn't been paid for by taking one four-letter word out. That's why I'm dogmatic about that. Do you know all the places? No, but I'm going to go through here and I'm going to show you some of them. So, well, I'm sure somebody showed Sure somebody showed me. That's how you learn. That's right. But they showed me and then when I study it out and I see it, I'm like, whoa, man. I'm going to pass it on. You say, why? Because I want you to believe the book. Not because I believe it or somebody else a whole lot smarter than me believes it. But because God shows you this stuff's important. If God was here right now and God handed you a, a piece of paper. He said to you, here's a piece of paper. And I, I wrote three words on here. I'd like for you to hold on to it. A few years pass and you look at that and say, well, I wonder if that's really what he meant when he thought of that. I, I wonder if I should change that. <laughs> God personally handed it down to you. Would you change it? Yes. While the audacity of somebody that would take something God handed down and think that they have the intelligence to change it and to say that they could outthink God. A fellow told me one time, he said, Preacher, he said, you, you know, the truth of the matter is you're just uneducated and if you would get you some education and you would learn some things, then you would learn that, you know, you're just, when it comes to these matters about Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and Chaldean and stuff, when you, if you would just get those things and learn that, you would, you would see the error of your ways and understand that and there's no way you know, any man could preserve that. I said, you're right. He said, what? And I said, you're right. No man can preserve it. Right. I said, I've never one time said that any man preserved it. I said, I believe God preserved it. He said, well, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, kind of like he's, you know, patronizing me a little bit, kind of looking down on me in pity and that kind of a thing. And all I said to him was something I thought of a long time ago. I said, well, let me um, say this. I'm dependent on him to preserve my soul. But I guess I should be worried about that if he can't even preserve some words on a page. I guess I should worry about whether or not he can preserve my soul. He said, well, that's not in question. I said, if there's question on the words that he wrote, that's what my salvation's based on, then there's question on whether or not he can preserve my soul. I said, you scare me. He said, why? And I said, I don't ever want to get that educated. Because I said, you have to be educated to be that dumb. So, got me another friend out of that one. All right, let's stand together. I, I appreciate you coming tonight. I know it's a, a, a difficult studying these things and running these. It may seem... Uh, a little bit tedious to you, but I think it'll help you as we run through these things. And, uh, and if it doesn't and you get bored with it, then we'll peel off of it. And i got a lot more stuff here, but I, I hope that'll help you.